Bloomberg Audio Studios. Podcasts, radio, news. This is the Bloomberg Surveillance Podcast. I'm Jonathan Farrow, along with Lisa Abramowitz and Anne-Marie Hordern. Join us each day for insight from the best in markets, economics and geopolitics. From our global headquarters in New York City, we are live on Bloomberg Television weekday mornings from 6 to 9 a.m. Eastern. Subscribe to the podcast on Apple, Spotify or anywhere else you listen. And as always, on the Bloomberg Terminal and the Bloomberg Business app. John Kirby, Admiral Kirby, fantastic to catch up with you, sir. Busy weekend, I'm sure, for you and the administration. Let's get straight into it. We've heard from Iran, at least they've indicated the matter can be deemed concluded. I think we all want to know, Admiral Kirby, whether Israel has indicated the same thing. I won't speak for the Israelis. I think you can understand that. Um, I believe the War Cabinet is still deliberating and uh, making their decisions. Uh, The President had a uh, a very good conversation with the Prime Minister uh, right after or towards the end of the attacks on Saturday night. Uh, And the President uh, was uh, was very direct that uh, this was a a huge success, uh, that that Israel can be proud that it doesn't stand alone and that it has superior military capability. Iran utterly failed in what they were trying to achieve. Uh, and that that success alone sends a strong message to Iran and to the region uh, about Israel's place there. So could we just define success? How can we define the weekend's events as a success to see the first direct strikes coming from Iranian soil yeah. on Israel? How is that a success in any way, yeah. shape or form? Yeah, let's, let's talk about what didn't happen. Uh, not not uh, no, Hardly any damage. Uh, and the only uh, impacts were to uh, uh, an air base uh, in uh, central Israel. Uh, no real casualties except, sadly, uh, a young civilian girl uh, was critically injured. Um, uh, and the vast majority, as the IDF have said, 99% of what Iran threw up in the air, drones and missiles, never landed, either failed or actually got shot down. So that's what didn't happen. And what did happen was Israel proved it has superior military capability and just as critically, they don't stand alone, that the United States, stand, the United States stands with them. I think people are maybe um, uh, uh, not cognizant of the fact that the president put U.S. forces in harm's way to help defend Israel. For the first time, American fighter pilots in the air shooting things down that were heading towards Israel. That's, uh, that, and, and they were extraordinarily successful in doing so. I think that's significant. You're talking about a successful defense. I think a lot of people also focus, focused on the unsuccessful deterrence. The president said don't, and they did. And we're trying to work out, Admiral Kirby, in what way the U.S. is able to influence Iranian behavior. Well, the president pre-positioned military forces in the region, which allowed for that unprecedented successful defense. Uh, The president uh, met with the G7 leaders yesterday uh, to talk about a unified diplomatic response and to consider other options and uh, alternatives to try to hold Iran accountable for what uh, it did on Saturday night. Uh, Iran is increasingly isolated in the world, certainly in the region, uh, and Israel has proven that it has friends. If Israel does not respond, is the new status quo that Iran can strike Israel from its own soil and there won't be a retaliation? Uh, again, I can't speak to that, Emory. That's going to be up to the Prime Minister and the War Cabinet to, to make those decisions. We respect that, uh, that, that it's a sovereign nation and they have to make those decisions. There's lots of reporting that the Biden administration, though, is verbalizing to the Israelis that they, they do not support a counter strike. Isn't that, in a sense, taking one of those tools out of the toolbox and brandishing it to the world? Uh, The tools that we took out of the toolbox were pretty significant on Saturday night, Uh, Anne-Marie. Ballistic missile destroyers uh, in the Eastern Med helping shoot down ballistic missiles, uh, fighter aircraft in the air, uh, other partners participating. There was a lot of tools in the toolbox and that that there's no question that Iran recognizes uh, uh, the coalition that was put together uh, to help uh, to help Israel defend itself. Again, I, I can't speak for what either side will do going forward. All I can do is speak for President Biden as commander in chief. Uh, and he has since October 7th, and he will continue going forward, making sure that we are meeting our commitments to Israel, but just as critically that we're meeting our commitments to our own national security interests in the region, uh, making sure we have the resources in place to protect our troops, our facilities, and the missions that we're conducting there in the Middle East. We've had 60 tons of arsenal fired upon 
Israel directly from Iran. We've had six months of Iranian-backed Houthis hitting as well, trying to hit even U.S. vessels in the Red Sea and disrupting global trade. We also had an uptick of uh, uranium enrichment by Iran. So to get to this deterrence, what is the U.S. willing to do? We have sanctions in place. Is the United States willing to enforce them? We have been enforcing sanctions. I mean, my goodness, in the three and a half years of this administration, uh, we have implemented more than 50 sanction regimes targeting more than 500 uh, entities and individuals. Uh, And again, I won't preview uh, coming sanctions uh, or anything like that, but I can tell you that uh, additional sanctions are certainly not off the table in terms of holding Iran accountable. Uh, And take a look at the additional military resources that President Biden has added to the region, even before October 7th. Uh, This is something that that he's been keenly focused on. Uh, and as we saw from Saturday night, Iran is increasingly isolated on the world stage. Uh, They are increasingly uh, making it harder for anybody in the international community uh, to be sympathetic to any of their uh, inimical interests there. So, again, I think we've done a lot. We'll continue to look at our options going forward, uh, and I suspect that uh, we'll continue to to hold Iran properly accountable. Admiral Kirby, how are they isolated? They had a call with the Saudis. They're sending all their oil to China. They're sending Shahad drones to Russia. In March, Iranian oil output hit a five-year high high. Where is the enforcement? There is enforcement of the sanctions, Anne-Marie. Again, this is one of the most heavily sanctioned countries in the world. Uh, And uh, we're going to continue to look at our options uh, going forward to hold them properly accountable. Sanctions are certainly not off the table. Neither is going to making sure that we've got the capabilities uh, in the region, and we do, uh, to thwart some of their destabilizing activity. You talked about the uranium enrichment. Um, When the previous administration pulled out of the Iran deal, uh, it vastly accelerated the degree to which uh, Iran could start to spin up their centrifuges and get closer to some sort of breakout capability. The president obviously tried, we tried, but Iran was not negotiating in good faith to get back into that Iran deal. But he also made clear uh, that we will not allow Iran to achieve a nuclear weapons capability. We prefer to do that through through diplomacy. But if not, we've got other options available. Well, what's diplomacy? Bob Malley, the Iranian envoy, is still under investigation. Who is leading these diplomatic efforts? As I said, the diplomatic efforts to get them back into the Iran deal are are no longer being pursued because Iran wasn't negotiating in good faith, which is why uh, we're going to make sure we have other options available to us to prevent them from achieving a nuclear weapons capability. Admiral, one question, and Emory did touch on this, this question around uh, what the response could be to Iran seizing a vessel in the Straits of Hormuz, the idea of freedom of the seas. What's the U.S.'s response to that, given the fact that a lot of companies have already started to rejigger some of their trade routes? and bake in extra costs as a result. Yeah, uh, yeah, I had a little trouble hearing you over the lawnmower there, but I think I got the gist of the question. Uh, we certainly condemn this most recent maritime attack. This is uh, uh, a tactic that the Iranians have used in the past. Um, we have, when able, uh, been able to interdict, been able to try to thwart uh, uh, other such maritime attacks, uh, not all of them, of course. Uh, and we are also making a concerted effort over time, and we have been somewhat successful uh, in intercepting uh, goods that uh, the Iranians have been trying to ship by sea uh, to some of their proxies in Iraq and Syria and certainly the Houthis. Admiral, one thing that a lot of companies are saying, a lot of executives, is that they do have to make contingency plans because they aren't sure that there can be such safety and you've seen insurance costs go up. Is it appropriate for the U.S., for Israel, to more directly respond to Iran at some point, just not now? Uh, Again, I can't speculate about future operations one way or another or future decisions that we might have to make. The president has been clear. We're going to hold Iran accountable for their destabilizing activities. He's also been clear that we don't want a war with Iran. We're not looking for another war in the Middle East or to see the conflict that's currently underway in Gaza broadened or or deepened across the region. Now, we'll have to see how things unfold over the next coming uh, days here. Uh, But uh, we don't want a war with Iran. And everything the president has been doing since the 7th of October has been designed to try to bring the tensions down and to make sure that the United States is best postured to defend our interests there in the region. You're in a fight now with a lawnmower, sir, so we're going to let you go. (laughs) National Security Council Communications Advisor John Kirby. John, thank you, sir. Admiral Kirby, we appreciate your time. With us around the table, together with Shanali, KBW CEO Tom Michaud. Tom, you've had a few minutes to go over this one. What's your reaction to this? So our, our feeling is it's 
it's two things. One is it's what's happening in the industry. So there is a rebound that's happening in investment banking. Investment banking was on a real downturn uh, over the last prior 12 months. And what you, we, what you see at Goldman is not even full power. I mean, we still think the industry, broadly speaking, is probably operating around 70% of what we would think is typical. So as we put the COVID period behind us, get to a more traditional moment, as IPOs pick up, M&A comes back, uh, and especially if we get lower rates, uh, we think the business has even further to go. So that's number one. Number two is, I think it's a big moment in the Goldman reboot. They also sold Green Sky in the quarter, uh, which is putting some of their consumer efforts behind them. And they're going to focus really on what's been the core of the company over the long term. Um, We've been really positive on the shares. My my sense is we'll continue to recommend it even after today's move. Uh, And as the company earns around 16 on tangible common equity in this quarter, it's a signal that they're starting from a very healthy point, even this reboot. Something that Shanali said that really stands out because it seems like a lot of banks are implying the same thing in their numbers, use a balance sheet. We're hearing that again and again, using their balance sheets more aggressively. Is this the new model, kind of going back to the old one as they try to compete with private credit and private asset managers? They got to use their balance sheets and they find ways to do it even with all the regulatory Well, I, I, I think that that's going to be key because we've just gone through a moment where the banks in general have lost market share to non-banks. And I, I personally believe in a 5% yield world with a flat or inverted yield curve, it's going to be harder to get financing than when money was free during COVID, okay? So having access to a balance sheet that's reliable is going to become more important to banks' clients. And over time, it could be part of the moment that helps these banks regain some share from uh, from that moment in time. Forgive me, there were years when a lot of these bank executives were saying that they can't do this, that they are hamstrung, their hands are tied because of financial regulations. What changed? Well, I, believe me, there, I don't think any bank's going to step outside of the financial regulations. I think it's just core blocking and tackling, which is uh, having reliable access. I think what's changed is the other markets aren't as easy. So zero interest rates meant that it was very easy for non-banks to be able to raise financing to be able to enter the market. It's going to be harder for non-banks to raise funding to serve bank customers. So I think that's what's changed. Not the banks, but I think it's the other items and other conditions. You said you like Goldman Sachs. Shanali was talking about how Ted Pick, his whole business has been... um, uh, really the trading and potentially we'll get a read through Morgan Stanley tomorrow. What other banks do you like? Well, we like Truist. very. It's one of our favorite ideas. It's one of the biggest banks in the nation. Um, they sold their insurance broker for a whopping price recently. They're going to trade. And what you don't see now is that they haven't put the gain into their financial statements yet. So the stock's really trading around 115 a tangible book, which is a very low valuation for one of the best banks in the nation. It's got a 5.7% yield. The next time that dividend changes, it's going up, not down. So, so our view is at a single-digit P.E. ratio for a bank that's got one of the best franchises in the country, that is, uh, I would say, our largest uh, bank idea at the moment, and we're pretty bullish on that one. And then, you know, they're also doing a restructuring. They got a little bit off sides after their merger, and we think the new management team is very focused on fixing things. When you look at the loan market at the moment, what do you make from it? Because I know in your notes you talk about the seasonality of it. Slow. Slow. It's slow. We're, what we're seeing in all the results that have come out, loans have actually been a little bit lower than we expected. And, and when I watch, you know, look, we've had three, now four banks report. Our sure. firm files 225. We've got a long way to go. But what do I think? I think delay in the pivot. So our bull case on the stocks, and, and we're market performed, so the bull case, we're, we're pretty balanced. But the bull case is that we're going to get a pivot and acceleration into earnings going into 2025. To the extent that we get less rate cuts, less growth, it probably pushes that back a little bit for when we see an acceleration in earnings. How, how aligned are you with the gloom of Jamie Dimon over at JP Morgan? What did you make of the caution from him on Friday? Typically, we're all mm. used to sort of beat and raise, beat and raise from JP Morgan. Then on Friday, things kind of changed. What do you make of that? Uh, I, there are still big macro risks uh, in the marketplace. And, and I'll tell you, when I talk to bank management teams, 
it's almost like I feel like I'm having a credit analyst discussion more than an equity analyst discussion. They're very focused on their own balance sheet. I think strength and stability seems to be a bigger presence in the strategic boardroom of these banks. They are building these banks to make sure they can withstand any challenge. Hey, Tom, if you look at the way Goldman and Morgan Stanley have been trading, they've been bears. Morgan Stanley's down more than 7.5 percent over the last 12 months. Does it deserve that? <laughs> are these kinds of investment banking and trading businesses just something people don't want to pick up on in this environment. I, I think for Morgan Stanley, it's just a preference for Goldman Sachs for us. We had been really bullish on Morgan Stanley. We pulled back. It's just the dynamics of what's happening in their own earnings at the moment. We just think there's more upside because there's more delta coming at, at Goldman. They can do a little bit more self-improvement, and so we like it more. But uh, So we're market perform on Morgan Stanley, but think it's a fine company. We just think the dynamics uh, don't have as much delta to them. Shanali Basak there alongside Tom Show of KBW. Just looking through the numbers, just to wrap things up, Shanali, quickly. B, B, B. How would you frame it any other way for Goldman Sachs this morning? <laughs> There's no other way to frame it. Remember, they've only been trading at 1.2 times book value heading into today. Morgan Stanley's at 1.5. It sets the bar super high for tomorrow. And remember, there's a big cloud over Morgan Stanley with a lot of questions about the investigations that they're facing. They haven't said anything yet. And so the earnings are one thing, but then the story um, is also going to be equally important heading into tomorrow. Let's get the scores up on the board again and just look at Morgan Stanley going into earnings at tomorrow morning. In the pre-market, it is positive off the back of what you're seeing on Goldman Sachs. Gold Goldman up by 3.4%, just beats across the board. And we talked, Lisa, briefly about the nature of the upside surprise. Let's just sit on fixed sales and trading revenue just for a beat longer. 4.32 billion, the estimate 3.64. That is a solid beat. And it really raises the question, okay, they're using their balance sheet more. So that means they're making directional bets or taking things down in a market that might look like it's liquid, but may not be as liquid. And then it also raises this question about just how much they're taking share from some of these other companies, just in terms of uh, private asset managers, which is something a lot of people have uh, talked about. But, uh, but also to remember, we don't have Credit Suisse anymore. So a year ago, Credit Suisse disappeared overnight in the UBS. So it, when you look at the statistics, I believe that market share was pretty much captured by many of the biggest other banks. So I think that's also on a year over year basis been somewhat of a boost. So when I asked Shanali, is the pie getting bigger or did they just take someone else's slice? Are you saying that slice belonged to Credit Suisse? Uh, I would say amongst probably others. I would say they're getting a bigger piece of the slice because okay. while I do think, and I think Morgan Stanley will benefit tomorrow from the market just being better. And, and, when the, and, and believe me, as someone who operates an investment bank, I pay attention to league tables and market share, believe me. So the biggest firms have probably picked up the most share, and it's a few firms who have done that, and Morgan Stanley and Goldman would be in that bucket. What's good for Goldman Sachs isn't necessarily good for Zions Bank, for uh, some of the others that are smaller regional banks. How much is the gain of big banks the loss of regionals? Well, <clears throat> well, they, they tend to do different things. So the net interest income world that they all live in is somewhat similar. It's the investment banking piece that really is the big delta that we've been talking about. So as we get away from banks that, uh, that report that don't have that, they're going to be more in, in, uh, attuned to what's happening in the interest rate environment. The good news there, though, Lisa, is that Six months ago, we would have been talking about the quantity of deposits. It's all about deposits, the quantity of deposits. The nice thing is that pressure has eased, and you're already seeing it in the numbers. Now it's the cost of those deposits. And we're waiting for the Fed to cut rates a little bit to take some of the heat off, because you know what? U.S. Treasuries are really competitive for bank deposits. We need the U.S. Treasury rate to back off a little bit for the banking industry to do a little better. And it is actually all about deposits, more so than Loans. When you say we're waiting, you mean the banks, because for the rest of us with money on deposit, we're not. We're waiting for them to pass on <laughs> well, higher interest buy rates -bills for the final thing. time. You know, make it happen. I'm Online, lazy. it's easy to do. I'm so lazy, Tom. <laughs> Tom Show. Thank you, sir.
Consumer spending has been strong. I think it is driven by strong fundamentals. Job growth has been solid. We've seen real wage gains. We're in a pretty strong economy with good growth. So yes, it's, it's part of that story. But uh, you know, we I think what we're realizing is we're getting a nice uh, tailwind from the supply side of the economy. Good uh, labor force growth, strong productivity, good real wage gains. So with that, I think you know consumers are are spending. What's the thinking in your office and among your colleagues about does this last or is this a surprise that you think could go away at any minute? Well, one thing that makes it really hard to forecast is we're still feeling the effects of the pan- the after effects of the pandemic and Russia's war in Ukraine and all the things that have happened in between. So we're definitely still seeing an adjustment process by the consumer, by in the economy overall. Um, but you know, overall, I think that the economy will continue to grow at a, a solid rate this year. Probably not as high as the 3.1 percent we saw last year, but something like two percent or, or around that. So I feel like we're still in a a good place, probably not as rapid a growth as we saw last year. Uh, Speaking of international events, I have to ask you, uh, the Middle East going on right now, how do you think about the economic and policy implications of these events. Right, so obviously we're watching this uh, very carefully. I think the primary way you see it through is uh, first of all through commodity prices, uh, but second is you know what we think of as a, a flight to safety, where investors, uh, when they see risks uh, in the global economy, they tend to bring money to, to the U.S. dollar, uh, and that tends to push yields down somewhat. Right now, I think you know markets are pretty pretty stable. We're not seeing big movements in that way, but generally that's the way I, I would uh, what I would expect to see when you see heightened geopolitical uh, tensions. When you think about uh, what the markets are reacting to and what could come out of this, is this more of an inflation worry or a growth concern? Well, I, I, it's really hard to say. It really depends on how uh, the situation evolves. Uh, right now, I don't think of this as maybe in the near term. Uh, it could be uh, effect of financial conditions and, and commodity prices, as I mentioned. I don't see this as a major driver of the overall uh, forecast for, or outlook for uh, economic growth or for inflation. Speaking of inflation, CPI came in much hotter than expected and uh, sort of freaked everybody out on Wall Street. And markets sort of took that as a turning point in Fed policy. Do you see it that way? I don't see it as a turning point. I think that, you know, we've, we saw inflation come down maybe quicker than we expected last year. We uh, definitely saw really uh, lower readings in inflation. The, in the final six months, that I never thought that that was going to stay that low. Um, that it was kind of unusually low. We're now seeing some uh, un- a little bit unusually high readings. Uh, overall, I think the picture is 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 one of that the economy is getting in better balance. Uh, we still have a strong labor market, and we're seeing inflation gradually come down. Now, I do think that you know, the, you know for me, what do I see in the data? Well, the economy, and, and you pointed out the you know retail sales today, but more broadly, the economy continues to be strong. Again, I think we're being helped by strong demand and supply, and those are uh, helping you know, growth. Um, and we're seeing you know, inflation come down a little bit uh, slower than expected. And so you know, I think markets are taking all that information into account and in how, they, how they expect policy to be. For me, I'm you know, data dependent. It's always really take the totality of the data and think about what it means for achieving our maximum employment and price stability goals. So I don't see this as a, a game changer or anything. I do think it's important information that will clearly, uh, you know, affect our, uh, th- my thinking and, and my forecasts. Even those who've thought about what PCE might be after the PPI and CPI say inflation isn't coming down rapidly anymore, but you do have the strong growth, you have very low unemployment. Why cut rates if the economy is doing fine at this level? Well, first of all, I think monetary policy is working at the rates that we have now. So I think uh, I think monetary policy is in a good place. Over the past six, you know, 12 to 18 months, we've seen all pretty much all the measures of imbalances in the labor market and our, and our economy recede, many of them back to levels we saw in 2018 or 2019. So we're seeing the you know restoring balance in the economy. We are seeing a slow uh, decline in, in inflation. So I do think monetary policy right now is in a in a good place. 
place. I'm not fixated on where do rates need to go, uh, you know, over the next year. What I'm focused on is what, how do we best achieve our, our maximum employment and price stability goals. The data we're seeing show that the economy is strong, and that's really good news, and labor market strong. At the same time, we are getting better balance, and we're seeing some decline overall in inflation. So for me, it's really about getting that right, and then whatever we need to do to adjust monetary policy, uh, we can do uh, to bet, you know, best continue uh, the progress towards our goals. Um, so that's how I'm thinking about it, and that, uh, we'll just have to keep watching the data and make the decisions based on those goals. Well, is your base case that you will cut rates this year? My own view is I think that with inflation continuing to gradually come down, and I guess I would say gradually is the operative word here, um, and with the economy remaining strong, I do think that given where the level of rates are, uh, real interest rates now are, are, are considerably higher than they were before because inflation has come down quite a bit. Uh, so we will need to uh, start a process at some point to bring interest rates back to more normal levels. And my own view is that we will, you know, that process will likely start this year. Um, but again, it's going to be driven driven by the data um, and achieving our goals. So it's possible you don't do anything this year. Well, again, you're asking me to speculate on what, sure. the, what will happen over the next eight months. <laughs> of course. Mark. And you know, right now, I think monetary policy is in a good place. We're 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 seeing the progress. We're seeing progress. Uh, it's a bumpy uh, road on on the inflation front, and we'll just have to figure out how to best adjust policy uh, as needed to achieve our goals. Well, you mentioned the uh, real rate. Is policy tight now? I do think we have restrictive monetary policy. I do think policy is tight. So how do I, what do I look for? Because uh, the economy is growing. It grew over 3%. You know, we're adding uh, about, what, 275,000 jobs over the first three months. So that seems like an economy that's really strong and not being held back by monetary policy. But if you take a step back, all these measures of imbalances in the labor market, whether job openings or wage rates or quits rates or all the other indicators we look at, all of them are moving from being very tight to less tight, and most of them back to more strong labor market or getting closer there. I mean, job openings are still high, wage growth is still a bit high, but these are all moving in the right direction. So I think the stance of monetary policy has really been an important driver of, re of restoring balance to the economy and helping bring inflation uh, to two towards two percent. Well, what's left with inflation? Is it? Uh, something that you can affect, uh, or are these non-interest rate responsive sectors? You know, monetary policy can affect inflation and the economy. It, it works through multiple channels. So there are some sectors that maybe are not as interest sensitive, but the economy is interest rate sensitive. We've seen that over the past couple of years as we've you know moved from accommodative policy to a restrictive policy. So monetary policy is working. I expect it to continue to work to to bring inflation down. It, you're going to see it, uh, you know, show up in different parts of the inflation rates, you know, goods versus services and things. But over the past year, year and a half, we have seen a broad-based decline in inflation in all these categories. It's just that we haven't gotten all the way to 2%, and we just need to keep uh, keep policy in the right place to achieve that 2% goal. question I always ask is, what are CEOs, companies telling you these days about their hiring plans, about what they're having yeah. to pay, and about inflation, whether they're raising prices or having to pay higher prices? Well, clearly, if you asked me this question a year or two ago, that's all they would be talking about. Price increases, compensation increases, the challenges of hiring uh, employees. Today, I think those, uh, you know, those comments are, are still out there a little bit, but far less than before. We're hearing from our contacts, uh, you know, that it's easier to fill positions than it used to be. Wage uh, compensation pressures are less and price pressures are, are less. I think that's consistent with what we're seeing overall in the data. You're the potential growth guy. Has potential growth moved up? You know, I am be getting more optimistic about potential uh, growth in the economy, I think for a couple of reasons. One is, you know, through the pandemic and everything that happened after that, I, like most people, had concerns that the supply side of the economy had, had suffered, you know, damage, uh, the labor force and in terms of labor force and participation. And, 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 you know, as we've watched the data over the past two years, we've seen a, you know, increase in labor force participation, increase in labor force growth, and we've seen a rebound in productivity. Now, I'm not saying that we're in some, you know, a new high growth uh, uh, kind of a world, but I do think a potential 
annual growth is probably closer to 2% or a little higher, which is well above a lot of estimates of the past uh, few years. And that's a very positive sign for, for U.S. real incomes and for the economy and honestly for helping get uh, inflation down. A question for all of our friends uh, around us on trading desks. <laughs> you had a briefing on QT uh, at the last meeting from the Fed staff and members, according to the minutes, generally agreed that it should start soon. Does that mean May or does that mean June? Well, I think we said fairly soon. And, and uh, the, uh, you know, I think that the reasoning for uh, slowing the, the pace of reduction of our balance sheet uh, makes a lot of sense. It's a prudent uh, course of action. Uh, we are decreasing the balance sheet quite rapidly. And, and by slowing that, we'll have more ability to monitor, assess, and analyze as we get eventually to an ample reserves uh, kind of world that we're aiming for. Everything is going with the balance sheet. Uh, everything is going exactly as planned. Things are going well. When we decide to uh, you know, slow the pace of the balance sheet, that's a decision for the committee. No decision was made at the last meeting, but obviously we'll get together relatively soon and, and discuss this further. But to me, this is a sign of success of the plans we laid out almost two years ago to reduce the balance sheet. We've had very little disruption in, in markets. It's, it's worked uh, exactly as planned, and we're just executing on that plan, and that's going very smoothly. So QT could come before break. Moves. Yeah, these are really separate issues. I mean, on our, our shrinking the balance sheet, we're focused on getting to ample reserves. On monetary policy, we're very focused on achieving our maximum employment and price stability goals. Those are different objectives. Those instruments uh, can obviously move at different times in different ways. This is the Bloomberg Surveillance Podcast, bringing you the best in markets, economics, and geopolitics. You can watch the show live on Bloomberg TV weekday mornings from 6 a.m. to 9 a.m. Eastern. Subscribe to the podcast on Apple, Spotify, or anywhere else you listen. And as always, on the Bloomberg Terminal and the Bloomberg Business App.